everyone, today we will be baking chocolate chip cookies for my demonstration for my chemistry in baking presentation. Today I'll be explaining how each ingredient contributes to the final product, the difference in cookie textures, and also the chemical reactions that happen in the oven, and also the chemical formulas for each ingredient. But before I do that, here's a brief history on baking. So let's take a historical stroll on baking. The first oven was discovered in Croatia about 6,500 years ago, so baking has quite a history. The earliest evidence of baking happened when ancient humans mashed wild grass grains with water to create a sort of paste, and they poured it onto a rock and it became something that was bread-like, but probably not something that we will want to eat nowadays. So they baked the first bread by putting the wild grass paste on a rock that has been sitting out in the hot sun and let it cook. There it is! It is ready and it became something like bread. In the middle ages, there was a completely giant gap between the wealthy and the poor and what they ate. The wealthy people got to eat really colorful cakes filled with expensive spices like saffron and fine ingredients like butter and flour, things that we take for granted today but really expensive in the past. While the poor could only eat stuff that the wealthy didn't want, it, they got to eat black bread and sharp rye bread and those things really suck. So only a handful of people in that poor population got to have meat for their minced pies. And that's a very tiny population. In the 16th and 17th century, the middle class grew richer and had more money to spend on baking and cooking. And because of that, their cookery literature grew, and so more books about cooking and baking was written, as well as kitchenware, the stuff that we use to eat every day. Because of all of this boom in cooking and baking, the education for pastry making became really popular in London. In the 18th century, the semi-closed oven was invented and that gave cake, cake making a soar in popularity. So you can think of it as Pyology's oven, it's kind of open, kind of closed, but you know, more cakes, so yay! Lastly, in the 19th century, people discovered the importance of baking powder. Nowadays, we have baking powder for so many recipes because it resulted from dense cakes to fluffier cakes. However, in order to achieve a delicious treat at the end, stoichiometry is required. Now, don't be scared when you hear the word stoichiometry because this time it's really easy. It's basically measuring things with the measuring spoons. Again, stoichiometry is defined as the study of quantitative or measurable relationships that exist within a chemical formula or chemical reaction. So what exactly is baking? Baking is a method used to heat food from the outside to the inside by eliminating the moisture content from the food itself or the mixed ingredients. It exposes the food to prolonged periods of heat without exposing it directly to the flame. I'm going to quickly offer an explanation for the importance of ratios and stoichiometry in baking because as you can see in the next photo that two different ingredients and two different ratios can result in two very different textures. So what I mean by that is that when you have crunchy cookies, you want to use only a certain amount of sugar and only shortening. As for soft and chewy cookies, you want to use both brown sugar and white sugar because brown sugar has some moisture that causes the cookie to rise a bit more than the crunchy cookie and the butter also has moisture in it, so it rises even more. So we're gonna start off by preheating our oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit for our soft and chewy cookies. In a small bowl, we are going to mix together one and an eighth cup of all-purpose flour along with a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. We're going to whisk these two together and then we're going to put it aside. Flour is and can be made from fine powders of different cereal grains like wheat, barley, and rye. Wheat flour has generally 8 to 14 percent of proteins, also known as gluten. This gluten is created when two proteins called gliadin and glutenin are transformed. Flour itself does not contain any gluten. 
Gluten is created when moisture, commonly water, comes into contact with the flour. Flour absorbs the moisture and sets the product we're baking through gelatinization. A process when the starch granules swell when heated in the presence of water. The starches in the flour, also known as C6H10O5N, breaks down the sugar, which means there will be food for the yeast, and because of this, it will result in a risen cookie. Baking soda is a base, and when it's reacting with acid, carbon dioxide bubbles appear in the cookie, giving it more air and making it flaky. This is called leavening, which is basically rising. Next, we're going to cream together one stick of butter along with a fourth of a cup of granulated sugar and half a cup of brown sugar. And I melted my butter because it wasn't working for me, so there you go. So I'm going to compare butter and shortening. So shortening contains hydrogenated fats, which are trans fats, and they result in softer and tender cookies, while butter contains water and has more flavor, but results in chewier cookies. Sugar, or sucrose, mainly serves as a sweetener in this case, because it's very sweet. And just FYI, brown sugar is the same thing as white sugar, and the only difference is the color as well as the flavor and the moisture content, because brown sugar contains molasses. Now add in half a teaspoon of salt, one teaspoon of vanilla extract, and crack in one large egg. However you'd like. I like to crack it with one hand. And beat it together until combined, but don't overbeat it, I guess. So obviously the salt, vanilla, and chocolate chips are mainly used as flavoring, but eggs on the other hand are a bit more complicated. When you beat eggs together, they begin to act like fats, or, you know, butter and shortening, but it kind of takes over their job a little, just, just a little. Eggs act like binders, because they bind everything together, just like your binder. And it's only because they coagulate, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Egg whites are the ooey gooey part of the egg, and they're also called albumin with an E, and they contain albumins with an I, so don't get that confused. A main albumin that is in the egg white is called ovalbumin, and you can shorten that to ova. Albumins comprise of 90% water and 10% proteins. And half of the 10% proteins, or about 54% of the proteins, are ovas, so very big percentage. Egg whites are healthier because they contain riboflavin, also known as vitamin B2, and so that's why you should eat more egg whites than egg yolks. Egg yolks, on the other hand, contain a emulsifying fat called lecithin, and this is great because it can bind to both water and fat. So little by little, I'm going to add in my dry mixture into my wet mixture and mix it, because if you pour the whole thing in at once, it's not going to be fun, it's going to fly in your face. So the next and best part, the chocolate chips, we're going to pour a cup of it into our batter and we're going to put it into the oven in the middle rack and close the door. Bake it for about 8 to 10 minutes or until golden and make sure to keep an eye on it. So now what happens in the oven you might wonder. On 92 degrees Fahrenheit, Spread happens, and this is really cool because it looks like a monster sprawling up. The butter melts into a puddle, and that means the ball of dough becomes a flattened cookie. Have you ever wanted to eat the brownie or cookie batter that was in the mixing bowl, but someone told you not to? Well, it's because they wanted to protect you from the possible nasty salmonella virus that could be hiding within the raw eggs. But at 136 degrees Fahrenheit, they all die, so you can feel free and eat however many batter you'd like. At 144 degrees Fahrenheit, the proteins in the egg starts to change, which causes the eggs to coagulate. And what I mean by that is, it used to be runny, and now it's semi-solid, so it's like squishy. 
You can think of it as frying an egg for breakfast. It turns from a clear liquid to a white squishy substance. The rise takes place at 212 degrees Fahrenheit and this is when the water in the dough starts to boil away and stiffens out the cookie and also the carbon dioxide gas starts to form inside because of the chemical reactions that takes place with the baking soda and vinegar. So the chemical reaction is 2NaHCO3 produces Na2CO3 plus carbon dioxide and water and by common terms this is sodium bicarbonate produces sodium carbonate plus carbon dioxide and water. At 310 degrees Fahrenheit, one of the most important steps in the oven happens. The color and flavor injection starts with the Maillard reactions, which is about 100 degrees after the rise. This is when the proteins in both the eggs and sugars rearrange themselves into ring-like structures and it causes a big change in the cookies. It reflects the tan color off the cookies as well as its delicious aroma to let you know that the cookie is more or less ready and you can take it out of the oven. So you don't really need a timer, you just need your nose. From 356 to 390 degrees Fahrenheit, another super important step takes place in the oven. It is called caramelization starting with maltose. It's what happens when the molecules of sugar oxidizes to form sweet, nutty, and bitter compounds. So as important as everything I said in the past 10 minutes were, I want to emphasize that the most important part of baking is not the baking part itself, but it's actually the stoichiometry. Just to clear something up real quick, in the beginning of the video when I held up my measuring cups, I meant to say that you need to be very careful and, and precise when you are measuring your ingredients so that you don't have too much of something or too little of something. As big and scary as the word stoichiometry sounds, don't freak out because if you freak out you won't be able to do anything and so you need to just think of it in baking terms. If you can measure things in measuring spoons, then you can definitely do chemistry or the other way around, but you just gotta have more practice. The main point of this video was to point out the specific ingredients I used in the cookie recipe to show how each ingredient can really, really contribute to the final product, and I hope that my research has given all of you some insight on this topic, but if you have any further questions, feel free to raise your hand at the end of this video or comment down below, and I will answer them to the best of my ability. So yeah, I am Elam and this is my presentation. I hope it was entertaining and enjoyable and educational. Yes, so thank you for watching. Bye!